Last week, we had the lovely Allison. What's her last name? I just know her as A Metaverse. Metaverse Al Al Allison. Alexander. Alexander, that's right. Uh, this week, and, and we all really enjoyed that time together, but I think we started that episode by even saying, guys, like, we need to talk with Allison and hear what's going on with her, but, like, there's so much else going on right now that it's hard to keep up. So we've got Balaji's million-dollar Bitcoin bet, right? We've got hyperinflation, and if we think the banks are coming, why are we chuckling? Because, Jared, I thought you would have been about that life. So, like, do you think we're hitting a million dollar Bitcoin? I mean, look. In yeah, 90 days. I do, but in 90 not days. 90 days. Yeah. No, man. no, no. He's, but it's, it's one of the best things I've ever heard because he's going to get so many followers. He's hopping on, he's just on Pompley on his podcast. He's going to make the rounds. It's like coming out with a, it's like coming out with a book. It's a tell all. Well, if you think about it, like, and I think Aussie, how many, how much Bitcoin do you, th did you say this guy had? He's got something like 10,000 Bitcoin. It's so like, ridiculous. so do the math, right? Like, what is that? Like, what is that, by the way? Someone do the math. We're at 20, we're at 28,000 Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Times how many? 10,000? I mean, yeah, he's got somewhere it's... in that region. Oh, so he's a 280 millionaire? Yeah. No. Yeah, 280 millionaire on Bitcoin alone. Okay, so if you think about it from a marketing spend, you're right, Jarrett. If he just spent a million dollars on this bet, and it's a legit bet verified through the blockchain, which I think it is, <laughs> like, he's set. He gets all the followers. He makes all the rounds. He never launched a book. He just put his money where his mouth is. And he'll give away that million dollars and have onboarded tons of people. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, is that, he just needs his portfolio to go up, you know, one or two percent and he makes up his million bucks. He doesn't like he, he doesn't need Bitcoin to even go up that much to make up for the fact that I didn't think about that. He lost. But, I didn't think about that. That is nuts. So, I mean, so where are we going to be? So I was just looking up the definition of hyperinflation and back of all of this is everyone's hyper fears about hyperinflation, hyperinflation being defined as uh, inflation exceeding 50% in a given measurement, mostly months, but sometimes it can exceed days. Do either of you feel, Aussie, you were hitting me with some economic data that said there's just no way we're hitting hyperinflation. What was some of that data? Well, CPI, if you look at the CPI data um, as far back as December, um, it's really not been, it's been trending down. Is it trending down steeply? No. But we've dropped from a year over year of over seven percent to yeah. six percent now. So, okay. so that's a a pretty significant drop. It's not, you know, it's not standard standard two percent, but yeah, you're still down one percent in over just under three months. So, translate that for layman's terms. We got some seven followers, eight followers, six followers, seven followers. We got we got seven people watching right now. Let's pretend one of them had no idea of how CPI correlates to inflation. Like, like, like demystify that real quick. So CPI is an e economic measure, basically the price, the change in price of consumer goods, consumer mm. products. Mm -hmm. So it's a basket of goods that's made up of food, housing, a whole bunch of different services, like even pet food and pet services, mm -hmm. finance services. Because pets uh, are people. Yeah, pets are people. Uh, <laughs> just about a general measure of the economy and yeah. different things that people spend money on in the economy. How much mm. you spent to have an accountant do your taxes mm -hmm. is semi considered as a portion within that basket. Mm -hmm. And all of all of those products and all of the these services are all kind of put together and weighted within mm. this measure called CPI. And it okay. measures how much change there is in the price of these services month over month and year over year. And so, for example, if inflation goes up, CPI goes up. Yeah, and if CPI, CPI would be positive. Going, got it. And so CPI is trending uh, if CPI is trending down, um, then that means inflation might be staving off a little bit, right? 
Exactly. It's saying that from this time last year, overall, the price of the goods within this basket mm-hmm. have only gone up on average 6%. Got it. Got it. And so, okay, so hyperinflation, doom scrolling is really bothering the crap out of me right now. Like the fear mongering is nuts. What is legit in either of your opinions of the fear of the market? Uh, in your I opinions. Mean, uh, so if we think about it from a crypto perspective, I think the fear about how do I get fiat into crypto yep. if I'm a U.S. citizen yep. and live in the U.S.? That is a legitimate fear. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Moves that we've seen towards banks around crypto, Signature Bank, Silvergate, and Silicon Valley Bank have all shown, hey, bringing fiat in from the U.S. into crypto, we don't like that. We're not about that life. Apparently. Boom, so, our gal. Hey. Hey, What's up, Allison? Good to see you. I hope everything's going well over there. So the onboarding is the fear in America. Now, you specify America. You're in Canada. Are you? Do you have access to onboarding sites, swaps that we don't? Like, can you get on Binance Global? I'm on Binance Global, but the one thing that I don't have access to in Canada, and I've actually had this discussion with Jarrett before, is... I can't deposit, at least on Binance Global, because of the province that I live in, I can't deposit directly from my bank account. Um, you can't actually do that from most of can, most Canadian banks. Interesting. Um, they basically block it. Um, so and Jarrett, while Aussie's talking about this, Jarrett and Allison, Allison, if you're still lurking, I want to hear from the UK, what's, what popular sites are you not allowed to access directly from the UK? And Jarrett, you're in Colombia. That would be very interesting to me. Go ahead, Aussie. You were talking about other access or other onboarding. So you can onboard mainly through P2P. So I can basically, we have a a system called, that's kind of like Venmo, where it's interact e-transfer, where I can send money from my bank account to someone else's bank account and that via Binance and essentially have them release or send me USDT from their Binance account to my Binance account. So, and people, a bunch of people make a bunch of money doing this. Basically, yeah. the people who want to offboard their fiat, uh, yeah. their, their crypto, will sell to these guys for a discount and then people buy it to, from them for a premium. Only yeah, a one to two cent spread, but yeah. still enough with enough volume. So, yeah. Yeah. And any nuances like that in Columbia that you're aware of, Jared, if you can hear us right now? Yeah. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm just having crap internet problems right now, but. That's life. Um, so in Colombia, it's P2P on Binance. And then Coinbase is pretty straightforward. You just buy from the exchange and Coinbase has pretty high fees. There are other platforms, but a lot of them have died in the last like 12 to 16 months. Um, I just think the market crushed them. And yeah. so they, you know, they weren't able to, to probably cover their liquidity. So that's how that goes. Now, I actually want to go back if we could. And I want to talk about the hyperinflation. Like obviously Please. when you get to 50% hyperinflation, you get 50% inflation month to month. That is crushing. Like your, your country's oh, yeah. done at that point. It's done. But I think we're in a situation that's more like the analogy of the frog in water that's boiling. And I also want to call out that that's actually not a real thing. We use that all the time, but apparently that's not a real thing. The frog in the water. Um, it will jump out. <laughs> yeah, it's, you put it in boiling water, it's going to jump out. But the point is that I don't even think you need to get to 50%. I think if you're at 5% month on month inflation, that's like having hyperinflation in the US because we're not year, used to that. For sure. For the, I'm saying month on month over a yeah, year yeah. to 60%. That would crush. And it goes back to the conversation I feel like we constantly have here where I guess I'm being the optimistic and Grant is being the, uh, I'm being the pessimistic and Grant is being the optimistic or the, the optimist. But it's like, dude, shit is not okay in the US. Shit is not okay around the world. People are really freaking hurting. And I know that you'll go back to what you said, and you're totally right, that, yeah, we're not seeing the lines we saw in 2008. Well, you can also apply online now, you know? Uh, and people are doing gig work where they have a job, but it's really just getting them to the next paycheck. And mm-hmm. so I think even at 3 to 5% inflation month on month, that would be like having hyperinflation in the U.S. or in, you know, 
if that was the case with the European Union, they would be in some serious issues. So if you're just going to mm. look at the global north, the global yeah. north needs to have a tenth of what the global south has to really find itself in a serious issue. And a lot of that is just that people in the global north are just have way more debt than people in the global south. Yeah. Um, I mean, even the United States is like two and two quarters more debt than we do have GDP. And that's just insanity. You know, if yeah. there was a bigger nation with more nukes that called our debts, we would be a developing nation in two days. So <laughs> if we can't print money and somebody called us on our debts and Thanos comes down, you know, and says, hey, where's the money? Well, hopefully we have the Avengers. Otherwise, we're pretty much shit out of luck. Do you think we're that, do you think we're that flimsy of, like, do you yes. think the system is that frail? Yeah, we just saw banks go down because they bought government bonds thinking it was going to be a good thing. And then when people said, give us the money back, they didn't have them. But so, yeah, but that that was a system. Really but but now that we know that Jerome Powell, the Fed, and Yellen, and and the Finance Committee all knew that that pressure would shut those banks down, it was it was like a year and a half long turn up the heat, turn up the heat. It wasn't overnight, and it wasn't just the bank balance. Like there was, there's been artificial raising with intent, I believe, I believe, to shut down the bank. And so to me, that that shows a kind of a resilient system that. The heat turns up. It was like, I think the numbers I saw, and correct me if I'm wrong in the public, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the numbers I saw was in December. They knew it as far back as December 2021. Who's and then uh, it was, it, I think Jerome Powell himself had it as one of the papers as a footnote in his report to Yellen and the, and the Finance Committee. I'm, I'm butchering the titles of these committees, but it, it, that's where we're getting the information from. And it's, they started reporting on that as far back as December 2021. Throughout 2022, they kept getting these footnote warnings of like, these banks, but, you know, we believe that it might be banks that are associated with cryptocurrency onboarding and on-ramping that might be da 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 And so my point, though, is, is about flimsy and frail versus not. I do believe society at large is a lot more, is held together by shoestring more than people realize, just, just a decency. But in terms of like a resilience against an out of control Fed, in my opinion, um, it shows resilience to me. But you don't think what, so? What, what shows resilience? Can you call? I really want you to be specific about what the you're calling endurance resilience. of over a year and a quarter of resisting, not failing, resisting active Federal Reserve rate hike action against their port, which basically had negative impacts on their portfolio. And holding out for over a year and a quarter against that action, raise after Fed hike after Fed hike after Fed hike, and they still didn't collapse earlier. So if their portfolios were, if this was mismanaged portfolios, well, wouldn't it have collapsed far earlier? You know, and so that, that's a question I don't know. I'm not an economist. There's smarter people watching today. Um, but, but let's actually... If you don't mind, this the impact we're to, we're talking about this because we're talking about the impact on crypto. And Allison, for those who are just now jumping in, she just mentions that she used to use Binance, but today had to find new resources. Binance will stop accepting the pound as of May. So this is an action by Binance, not the UK. No, it's spurred by an action in the UK. So this is something um interesting. Several banks in the UK have basically said they're no longer working with Binance. Um, Interesting. And or and not or not allowing people to buy crypto with um either their debit cards or credit cards. Um so the biggest banks, uh HSBC in in the UK, um made that decision. And then they are discussing legislation of only allowing people to buy so much. They, I don't know if it's CBDCs or stable coins or put so much into crypto every month um within the uk uh, interesting so that that's been a discussion that's been going on i don't have all the finesse details but yeah. um so well allison just gives you a thumbs up there she says that's right now i was asked on twitter and i asked you guys in in the whatsapp uh, conversation we're having that i was asked by Vic E. Uh, she's a new follower on twitter she said hey with silvergate and sb uh, svb going down um, if these are the kind of the bank, the bankers of on ramping into crypto, what are other crypto resources? I would have thrown people at Binance, at least Binance US all day long, Binance Global. But like what other and I mean on ramps, 
Coinbase, Robinhood still, yes, believe it or not. Um, and then you guys mentioned another, oh, crypto.com. But what other fiat to crypto on ramps are there? MoonPay? I was but thinking about MoonPay. I think MoonPay works and there's a couple others that might work, but they're I, I they're more finicky from from what I've I've learned. Jarrett? Yeah, I was gonna say there's Swan for Bitcoin. Swan. And then that's you right. can buy Bitcoin right now on or you can buy certain cryptos on Venmo, PayPal, that's Cash right. App, and Square, or which is yes. now Block. So there are a good amount of on ramps in the United States. And I think that I don't actually know the exact specifics around what's going on with the UK. Uh, Allison says she's MoonPay today. I don't know the exact specifics about what's going on today right now with Binance in the UK, but they may get Binance.UK, which is something that is a lot more regulated, just like ah. the US got Binance.US. When yeah. I first bought crypto back in the day, I was using Binance.com, Binance Global. And then one day you went on and you had to create a whole new account. And you basically had like two weeks to move your crypto over to that new account. Um, and I actually still have crypto on my Binance Global, but I can't take it into any on-ramp in the U.S. In so the if US. I had a bank in the Europe, if I had a bank in Spain, I would be able to take it into that on-ramp. Um, Justin Tate says, I'm trying Juno mainly to get crypto uh, off, but I think you can get, get it on as well. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard of Juno. And I'm going to just say, Justin, that make sure you do your homework because the way that you just said that was the way somebody once sold Voyager to me. Uh, and I'm glad I never touched it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and and to to be fair, Justin Tate is the maverick of our Discord. He's Mister Research. Like this guy is Mister Homework. Um, he was talking to me about curve yields and stuff before anyone. I mean, like he he was he was the OG as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you're right. Like, there's a lot of goofiness, and it's sounding like these things can shutter at any time. And you know, my response to this Twitter user was. Listen, there's dozens, there's dozens of on-ramps, but like we literally only named about five. And, and that's, you know, if this were a business and I had five clients that represented all of my business, that is called a risky business in terms of being able to, to on-ramp and off-ramp. Are, are, what services do you guys know? Let's say, let's say everyone acted right now, took up Balaji on his million dollar bet, got into Bitcoin, Crazy inflation, maybe not hyperinflation kicks in. Crazy inflation kicks in. They've got their Bitcoin. It mooned. So now they're sitting on way more money. Everyone else is brokies. Do you know services that are easy to use with a debit or credit card um, where they could get their money off and pay for things? Um, there is Spritz Finance is a new one where you can pay your bills via crypto. Interesting. So the, it, ta it takes seven day settlement. So it isn't an instant with your credit card or your debit card payments, but you could potentially pay your more, make your mortgage payments with crypto through, through Spritz. Did I, did, did I spell it wrong? Brits or Spritz? Spritz. S-P-R-I-T-Z oh. finance. <laughs> I love Zed. I love Me too. Zed. I love it. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an affect of you, uh, of you UK Commonwealth colonies. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, so Spritz Finance, that, that's a great resource to hear. And of course, I mean, Coinbase, you've got the debit card. Crypto.com, I believe, has a debit card. But like these seem like um, they're, they seem like if, if anyone's going to come, uh, the lockdown is going to happen. It's going to happen with them because they're playing nice with the central government, you know? Uh, they aren't. So something very interesting is Coinbase is talking about moving overseas because stop it because of the regulatory uncertainty in the U.S. You can catch it there first. We covered it on decentralized news yesterday. Okay, check and... it. Okay, decentralized news from Aussie. <laughs> I say shameless plug. Go for it. Um, yeah. so you did cover it on the episode yesterday. Yeah. And it had it was it's very recent news, but they're they're talking about moving overseas because of regulatory uncertainty. Interesting. What, Jared? What do you? I mean, about? Brian Armstrong can always move into uh, SBF's old house in the Bahamas if he's down. So I'm, I'm sure it's that. empty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As with Epstein Island. Um, 
Uh, so Justin T says, true, he uses Gemini and Binance.us. I forgot about Gemini. Gemini is still around. Gem I Gemini is another one, yeah. Gemini is still around. So we do have a good half dozen. And I do know the Winklevoss twins, who are the Gemini heads. They are not trying to necessarily uh, assuage regulators. So they will hold out. Of the ones we've listed, and this is news to me about Coinbase, but of the ones we've listed, I feel like Gemini actually is the one that will hold out the longest in terms of keeping its doors open to U.S. Uh, crypto traders. Uh, maybe MoonPay. MoonPay is, seems kind of uh, unbiased. Go ahead, Jared. Well, if Coinbase goes abroad, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be playing with the U.S. regulators. I, I think that they could still offer services, right? Or yeah. you're saying if they go abroad, they wouldn't offer services. I mean, I just don't see how Coinbase is going to step away from the U.S. market with our middle class. Uh, I don't see how that works. So, Well, I mean, no, I agree. I, I'm saying when they step away from the U.S., most of these um, organizations, like I remember Gate.io, I think it was, mm -hmm. it had, it had um, it, it's a decent onboard. And at the time, um, I did have to use a VPN. I did have to do a KYC to get anything done. Um, but there was a workaround that was kind of an obvious workaround and they're kind of like, eh, are you American? Whatever. Make your deposits up to this amount. You're good. And, and then I would roll that money right into like for a, for Cardano 88 into Yo Roy or, you know, my ledger nano or something like that. So, um, what is so funny? I just laugh about your ledger nano. Cause I just still think it's ridiculous that you carry that thing everywhere you go. It's it's right on my desk because the average person just won't even know what to do with it. Like the it looks average like a USB key. It really does. The pe people won't know what to do with it. it. It'll even say it says resilience by design. They will even look at it and be like, I they won't look at it and think there's money. Right. Like the average person look at my desk and they're like, OK, what here is money? That USB device. Get out of here. <laughs> you know. So are you guys worried at all? I mean, we're talking about this. Are you guys worried that this is actually the apocalypse, the crypto apocalypse for us in terms of onboarding and offboarding? I think we're going to make good money, like honestly. But <laughs> listen, they will know now. I seriously <laughs> doubt the criminals breaking into my house in this neighborhood are scrolling through my YouTube and like, <laughs> oh, you want if they if they know you live there and they know you're a YouTuber, they just might. Look, they just look might. <laughs> yeah. So, are you guys worried about onboarding, offboarding, and regulation? Onboarding the and offboarding in the U.S. Absolutely, I have no clue what's going to happen to you guys, and if you guys are going to be CBDC bound for the rest of your existence. Um, you, you still think that that's imminent? I mean. It's not happening tomorrow. Is it happening three to six months? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the Fed is hiring, has been hiring developers wait, wait, wait. to develop you, it. I just saw Jared's face and, and I had to listen again to what you said. You said three to six months we could have a CBDC? Yep. Without a question. What are you talking about? The Fed's been hiring developers to build a CBDC. I, there's been postings. You can see them. They're looking, they're looking to hire and they're hiring. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking like legislation alone, the groundwork for legislation has to even be laid still, right? Mm, so three to six months is really, really fast. Aussie, you've got August. No one works on Capitol Hill if they can avoid it. That's true. Uh, that's going to be toward the end of your three to six months. Uh, DeSantis, uh, I, soon oh, to I be know. presidential candidate has said he does I, I, not I, want the CBDC. Has he said that? I, yes. He yes, came he out wants, today. He's and trying said to that. ban it. He's trying to ban yeah. it in Florida. He came out and said that today. So I think three to six months is aggressive. I think in the next 24 months, you're definitely going to see some huge movement with it. I think yeah. it really depends who comes into the presidency. If it's DeSantis, he's obviously going to never let it happen. He's going to sign an executive order. So I really think three to six months is a very short timeline because just legislation alone, like there's a lot of things that are proposed and they get a lot of fanfare and they get a lot of headlines. But all of them are DOA. You know, they're dead on arrival. They're not going to go. The Congress is so tight and the Senate is so tight in the United States that, like, they like to just take pot shots at each other. And so yeah. even if something's really great for everyone, they're like, no, they, they put it up so we hate it. And it's just gridlock. So yeah. I really don't think that's going to happen. Um, 
I know that that's been a lot of the fear that they're going to start to control us and we're all going to be on CBDCs and, you know, not crypto browsers are going to get shut down. And my wallet's going to get banned because I say the government's flimsy and the bank system shit. But I'm not really worried about it. And I don't think we should be worried about either the on or the off ramps because at the end of the day, uh, there are very, very wealthy and powerful people that are into crypto. Yes. Uh, Fidelity yes. is into it. BlackRock is into it. Like high. They are not going to let this just go quietly. I don't know the amount of lobbyists that are currently in DC that do crypto, but it will be three to five fold in the next 24 months. This is not going anywhere. And if the United States steps out of crypto, we're basically stepping into the stone age. And, then, and there's enough people in Capitol Hill that understand that, that I don't think it's going to happen. So I think this is fear. This feels like another telenovela day where everyone gets okay. their panties in a twist and excited. But like, let's zoom <laughs> out and realize it's probably going to be okay. Yeah, Jer Jared's panties are obviously in a twist right now. No, he's a, de a, de a deep twist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to give well, you an idea, crypto spent twenty-two million dollars on lobbying um, last year, which was a doubling from twenty twenty-one. Who was this? Crypto, crypto. companies. Oh, crypto at, at, large. Large. at large. At large. So, um, yeah, I, I think do we see two to threefold in the next year? Probably and probably again continue to see that number double and double and double yeah. for the next five years for the next foreseeable year uh, time. But I I do still see there's more and more willingness or interest in trying to narrow and control how that money gets on or gets yes. off. Um, I do see that increase definitely. And so you mentioned fidelity, Jarrett, and. Yes, they're into crypto, but it's all it's all them controlling the crypto. It's not you can't withdraw all, like Fidelity Crypto just rolled out like yesterday or two days ago. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it's all their control. You, it's it's not your keys. They're all centralized exchanges. They're not exactly exactly. But that's it's a really good case study of a tradfi that's able to basically become a coin base. And because they're already, Fidelity is one of the most known companies, probably the world over in investments, they're going to be able to already have the ins to be able to talk with, 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 with Washington and the lawmakers to be able to basically speak their language. I think when you have Brian Armstrong in front of Congress, it's different than having the CEO of Fidelity in front of Congress talking about these things. One is a crypto bro. The other one's a TradFi who's trying to be open to a new digital asset class. So I... I'm yeah. not, this just goes back to, I'm not worried about it. And I think it makes great headlines, but yeah. people shouldn't like really freak out about what I think we should really talk about. And I don't think you guys weighed in on it is because we're talking ridiculous timelines. Do you guys think it's possible that Bitcoin gets to a million dollars in 90 days? Not 90 <laughs> days, bro. Not 90 days. I mean, like. I have been massively impressed. And to the public watching, if you're watching, you probably are equally impressed at the bump from 16,000 to 28,000 that came. And I think the three of us can agree there was some correlation to a capital flight from TradFi and fear of what's going on in the market into at least hodling in the crypto space. And the reason I say hodling is if this were an actual market move, I think we would have blown through 30,000. Like, like when we know, the three of us know, and those watching who are familiar with crypto know that when there's a breakout in our space, like it is a nutso breakout. But this breakout, in my estimate, is actually kind of conservative. It's been, it's been impressive. People are like, oh, you guys look like geniuses. And I was like, well, it's been two weeks. And it's, and it's gone from like 16, 17,000, 28, but it's like hovering and, 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 and any of us know, hey, we're cool. It's probably going to pull back and that's all good. It, to me, that's people moving money and sitting on it and like, like waiting to see when they're going to put it back into a stable trad fly, but they're not, tr they're, they're probably staking. They're not like trading. It's not like high trading volume, if that makes sense. Now, Aussie could speak to this a little bit better. Go ahead, Aussie, because he, Aussie has trading bots and he pays attention to volume. Can you speak to volume? The volume has, recently so in the last i'd say week or so been ticking up volume for most of february was for the second half of february into the first half of march was crap absolute garbage mm -hmm. um 
it was garbage through December and then the new year started and, you know, we started, volume started to come back again. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. we, we've seen spikes in volumes like here and there, um, mm-hmm. but not, I, I wouldn't say to a point where we're talking like we were seeing the last bull run. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we're see, we see spikes in volume here and there, yeah. but not it's not sustained higher volume. Like I can say like this week since basically the banks collapsed, um, volumes about double. Uh, What Jared? I just love that. That's like a thing that Aussie says without a normal sense. Hey, you know, since the banks collapsed. (laughs) Yeah. Since since the bank collapsed, uh, the big bank collapse, we've essentially seen a doubling in, in volume. Um, like an average volume, and then some spikes have gotten pretty, pretty significant, like um, much higher than that. But uh, a doubling, getting close to almost tripling in some cases um, in, in daily trading volume compared to a few weeks ago. Interesting. And I guess when we see a full bull run breakout, I feel like the volume um, on the ledger books is like significantly higher of the in inflows and outflows and to me it feels like just my intuition just my humble opinion to me it feels like this was correlated to a capital flight and that's okay and it's proving its case but the long-term hodlers are like hey it's going to do whatever and it does for me it bolsters my confidence that dude it could pull back to 16 i don't even care like in fact if it does i want to buy more because we're going to see more banking issues we're going to see more inflation issues and we're now proving that there's like, it's like a hidden pocket. Like, I don't even know how to describe crypto. It's like, you know how when people eat so much, they're like, I'm going to put it in my other stomach, you know? And it's like, when did you get another stomach? It's just this weird phrase they say. We didn't, ha- it's like having an extra wallet that they didn't have before that's kind of perceived to be untouchable by these, these government powers. So while it's unstable, let's just move it over here and let's let it sit. And then we'll move it back in. It's like another chess move that the average retail trader has or the uh, retail banking client has. Um, so do I think it'll hit a million in 90 days? No way. Could it rally and, and shock us? I think we could be shocked if inflation gets out of control at if we approach that the magic 40 number, right? That's a number that Jarrett and I are watching for our fund. I mean, it's just stuff we're kind of paying attention to, like, Hey, you know, this would be a great number if we could put money in a pile for people and let it hit that number cuz that the the expected return on a TradFi fund would barely scratch that, but we know like it could hit 40 without blinking if the market just turns right one day. Like if if it rains right in Africa and this thing happens over here like Bitcoin could just show up and be at 40 and we've done really well. Um so I think we could see some surprising numbers. I don't think we'll see a million away. No I, I go ahead, Aussie. I see the year closing around 40, 40 to, to, to 50. I, I, I have a hard time saying 50. I, I think we close around 40, uh, for, for the year, year. for the year. I, I'm seeing maybe we, that 30 number that you're talking about, maybe we hit that before the end of day tomorrow when yeah. Jay Powell speaks. But I've got a feeling the market's going to maybe be shocked or, disappointed when they hear him speak tomorrow and really we're gonna see the market a half out. point you're gonna see a half point no we're not gonna i don't think we're gonna see a half point i, I think okay. a half point that's not on the table we'll see a quarter point but the entire market the tone. is it everyone's expecting this month last one we're done we're gonna be talking about pulling cutting rates as soon as june or july that's what all the forecasters are are saying on cme right now oh so people are going to get depressed because they're lasting another quarter at these rates and they're not going to start cutting now so okay i see well so that's the expectation right now is we're going to start cutting in june or july and now i'm thinking he's going to say maybe we're not done i I, i'm going to say maybe there's another quarter basis point maybe he doesn't firm and say yeah we're done we're pausing we broke the banking system we need to hit pause and he's not going to hint that we're they're looking at cutting rates interesting 
the, he's going to be we could we're, we'll be looking at holding rates for a sustained period of time and potentially and likely hint that maybe we don't see cuts before the end of the year that's and we'll, we'll call the market, aussie the uh the canadian oracle of america of american federal reserve man he's got he's got it on lock um yeah jared so does that scratch your interest i mean i i i don't see i don't see it yeah um yeah. i mean uh, powell originally said that they weren't going to they were going to cut rates until 2024. So for him to start cutting rates in June or July is pretty crazy, mm -hmm. which I just think we're going to see. What we've seen is that they're going to protect the banks and yeah. they want to probably avoid a situation where they have to protect more banks. Mm -hmm. So they're going to probably pause. And then as Aussie says, maybe cut rates if they do. Okay. But then we're going to have some crazy inflation. Um, and I think we've already had at least the craziest inflation maybe I've ever seen in my adult life, but I just think we're going to see some crazy inflation. Uh, Even beyond. Think, yes. Well, you, you, you have, you have two ways. You either crash the economy or you get inflation. And he's decided he doesn't want to crash the economy because of what happens and people freak out and if banks aren't secure and people are going to be running all the banks. So they're going to go for inflation. That's the only other way they're going to do it. And if they start printing, mark this, somebody write this down. If they decide to do quantitative easing, they, they turn on the printer more than they already have because they put $300 billion in the balance sheet to help out S S S SVB. If they turn on the printer, though, to the tune of trillions before 2023 is over, just people are not going to be able to handle when Bitcoin hits 300000 in 2025 because it's just going to get out of control. It's already out of control, right? The system is already broken. When you are stuck between inflation or the recession, you're already, you, you, you have no good move, right? So I don't really know what's going to happen, but the system is definitely broke. And I think it's becoming more apparent to not just people like us that are looking at the market that are, you know, into crypto, into an alternative financial uh, rail. But like so many people have talked to me over the last two weeks because they know that like I'll post about Bitcoin or post about the banks and they have no idea. They just have no idea. You know, they have like their 401ks, they have their mortgages. And they think that's going to, you know, keep them, keep them okay. But yeah. like, maybe it actually will, but the prices that they're going to end up facing at the supermarket and at the gas pump are going to get out of control. Um, and like I'm saying, and like we said, even if it's 2%, right? If it's 2% a month inflation, that's 24% on the year, if not more, mm. if it's like compounding. So like the average American family can't handle this. Never mind many people in the global South. We're going to continue to see like serious issues over the next couple of years brought on by this ridiculous situation that honestly, the United States has kind of put everyone in because we are the reserve currency, you know, um, mm. it's not good. We are like what happens in the United States affects other places when it comes to our monetary and fiscal policy, affects yeah. other places, two or three to four to five times worse than it affects us because we can print, we can bail ourselves out, right? Other places don't get bailed out, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think what we should do, if we're looking into Darwinism, you should let some banks fail. I That's agree how should that. happen. I, I think that. you should probably help out the depositors, but I don't think you should be able to acquire a bank for $2 on the share. Absolutely not. That mm. bank fails. That thing's done. It's under. Because all you're doing is creating this Russian babushka doll situation where you're just going to have four <laughs> or five big banks in the United States, all the small banks, all the community banks. They're all going to be gone because people are already leaving them now to go to Bank of America, to go to Wells Fargo, to go to Chase, to basically knowing that those banks will be FDIC insured at the end of the day because they literally are too big to fail. We learned nothing from 2008. The Republicans have totally rolled back. You know, they rolled back with Trump the Glass-Steagall Act in 2018, and that's how we get here. Um, mm. You know, being able to make ridiculous decisions and having really like no like fiduciary responsibility that's ridiculous what so, um, i'm done i'm done with my uh, TED talk. Uh, so you created this dichotomy of the difference between um recession and inflation and that fact that these are the extremes on the spectrum are a sign that the system is broken I, I have to, I think I have to come against that. That is every system, right? Those are the extreme potentials of every economic system. 
Mm. I'm not sure of every economic system, but those are the two options that the U.S. currently has in front of them. And those are the only two options. I think I I kind of agree for the U.S. Like Canada, the banks aren't breaking. Our banks are working fine. And we're just to the north of you. And we've had inflation just as bad as you guys or maybe a little bit less, not as bad, but close to it. And we're not having any problems. The economy in the U.S. is on such a shoestring that either they keep hiking rates so that inflation comes down and they keep breaking the system, like they've started breaking the banking system. Although Signature Bank, tinfoil hat, Signature Bank was fine. <laughs> um, That's a Clinton bank right there. It's a New York bank. That's a Clinton bank. <laughs> <laughs> tinfoil hat, people, relax. So, so Aussie, what do you think is the distinguishing factor just in your microcosm, the difference between uh, Canadian banks and American banks, what is the defining factor that you think is different that makes it, well, there's no banking crisis here? Well, I think there's bank, banks are working to make a lot more money off money within the U S. So there's okay. in, in Canadian banks, I think there's the risk management is just a lot smaller. Like there isn't, there isn't as much leeway, I think, for, for decision-making on, on banks. And we don't have as many small banks. We've got about six kind of big banks and a few online, smaller online banks. We don't have a micro, like a massive variety of banks. It's basically, you go to one of the six big banks and then maybe there's eight to 10 kind of minor banks or regional banks that exist in Canada. Stupid question here. And Jared, cut me off if you have thoughts on on any of this. Stupid question here. Is are Canadian banks on a a fractional reserve system like the US says supposedly, even though we're on zero reserve, do they have a fractional reserve system? I actually don't know. That's um, I'm literally Googling this right now. Um, That's curious. Jared, go ahead. No, I was going to say, oh. I just assume on some level, they must have a fractional reserve system. I mean, because they're, I, they're... Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, if you want to like understand how broken the system is, the fact that like banks in the US have stocks is mind blowing to me, that you basically can take a financial bet to see which bank is going to work. And so therefore the bank has to basically get stockholders, their money, you know, boost stock by like having returns. That's just like in no sound system, should the banks have a stock that just doesn't make any sense what okay this is no new way. to me like are, are do other countries limit that we've got I, bank stocks in canada but i mean even if you do idea. even if you do even if you do i'm not i don't care who has it i'm saying i think it's a broken idea you know oh okay yeah, okay i didn't know if you were referring to like well nordic countries they don't no no, no 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 i'm just okay, saying like, like like in theory like philosophically i just think it's a, that's a really broken thing that's it's a really messed up thing yeah. So because so then it, because the, because listen 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 if, if you and I have a company the three of us have a company and we make uh, water bottles right and it goes public right yeah. we are supposed to be getting for our shareholders the max amount of profit we can like that's yes. our responsibility we want to get you the most we can so yeah. if I'm the bank now yeah and you buy the stock to the bank yeah. right but Aussie puts his money in my bank. Yeah, I have no responsibility for him for his money. I only have a responsibility to get you more money because you bought the stock. Does that make sense? He just gives me his money and basically it's an IOU. And if I give it back to him, that, that really depends. But for every dollar yeah. he gives me, I'm going to lend out 19. I yeah, mean, that's like, how the fractional reserve system works. So I just think having an incentive for a bank to make profit is really dangerous. The bank is just supposed to be there to hold our money and give it back to us when we want. It's not supposed to be profit driven. It's the same way with like our healthcare system. The healthcare system should be set up to provide healthcare and support citizens, not make profit. But in the United States, everything has to make profit or it doesn't make sense. But that is flawed. That is inherently flawed, in my opinion. I, I'm going to back Jared up on this because I totally, I totally agree with him. As a Canadian, I have free healthcare, although we do have some private healthcare. So dual system. Not very great, uh, but 
I totally agree because you see it in how the banks behave. We see, I see it in how we get client service in Canada, just pushing products, increasing fees. Um, like the staff at my, at the bank that's near my parents' house, 90% of the offices are empty now and they're consolidated to a, a more regional office in a bigger town um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes over. So I think banks, that's all because they're trying to cut costs, make more money for their shareholders by upping the fees that they're charging me for keeping money. I'm getting charged to keep money in the bank. Like you're and you're len you're making money on the money that's in the bank anyways. No, so, I do think that's crazy, but like, like, so Jared, just to be clear, you're talking about a government banking system, a subsidized one. I'm not talking about a government banking system. <laughs> I'm talking about a banking system. Excuse me. I'm talking about a banking system where the bank is just as responsible to the depositors as it is to its shareholders. And that's not how our current system is set up. And I think that that's totally messed up. And your water bottle example. Sure. Because that was the metaphor. And I do agree with that metaphor. You have um, a stockholder, a shareholder, and you have a, a client buying a water bottle. You, in the bank, you have a shareholder and you have a client acquiring money and money vehicles, not just deposits, but also loans and, and financial things. And the impetus and the idea in the free market is that if I provide crappy enough service and crappy enough products that do not benefit that person, then they'll take their business elsewhere. I think the flaw in America is that the federal government is involved at all in the banking other than regulation, the, meaning the Federal Reserve. That, that I, think, I think that's a problem because the perception is that the bank is a government institution. And so we feel like we have to have it. I have to deposit my money here. I, I kind of need it. And it's like, well, no, you're not a necessary part of society, especially now that we have cryptocurrencies. And, and but more importantly, like local banks, they usually have to fight tooth and nail to get deposits because they don't, I, I can't take my debit card all around the world. I have to have a Visa card. So I, I think the perception of the bank is what throws me off. Go ahead. So I have a small bank in, the, in Massachusetts. It maybe has 15 branches, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have their debit card and I bring. I think we lost your platform, but I oh, use that all around. They, the only way they can compete with big banks is they give me free ATM fees. So they basically yeah. reimburse all my ATM fees. Um, I guess my problem is I just don't think, I, I agree with you. I don't think that, like, I think the government should let the banks that fail, fail. I agree with that. Big because time. then you're not going to go back to those banks. Is exactly what you're saying. In an open market, I'm going to say, okay, me as the depositor, I'm going to be like, why would I go to that restaurant? It made me sick. I That's can right. choose to go to the other restaurant. And eventually that restaurant goes out of business, right? Yeah. The government doesn't come in and say, oh, you know, Bob, we're here to help you out, right? Yeah. And so when you start to do that, and because we print the money, yeah. we inflate the balance sheet, and we're going to eventually, and like, you know, we're going to hit inflation that way. So mm -hmm. I, agree I think, I, I, I don't know. I just go back to the idea. I think it's asinine that there are stocks in the bank because then you're basically betting on which banks are going to make the most profit. And then those banks are there and they're incentivized to make more profit, not just like make a little bit of profit and make sure that we're keeping everyone's money safe. So if they come and get it, we can give it back to them or sell our gold or sell whatever assets we have on hand to make sure that there's not a bank run. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's no, we have like, you know, it, it's just like in the healthcare system in the US, the fact that there's like hospital administrators, right? You shouldn't be in a mm -hmm. hospital unless you can do CPR and save someone's life. If you're not, then you're just hanging out. You're just a bro. And so like, I have serious problems with the way the U.S. sets up its like entire structure to help people because how people, if they're healthy physically and if they're financially healthy, those are two really important parts of people's lives, you know? Interesting. And, and most people don't have these conversations and they're not thinking about this. They're just going to go put their I money in that. a bank and they have no idea what's going on. They're like, no, 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 don't worry. It's FDIC insured. Well, Janet Yellen has come out and told us yeah. that doesn't matter. Because yep. unless your bank is big enough to cause a systematic issue a yep. across the U.S., well, we may not, we just may not be bailed out.
if so, your deposit is exceed two hundred fifty thousand, is what he's saying. If your deposit is yeah, exceed yeah, yeah. two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or you know, you, you've yeah. taken a loan out against your house or whatever it is. So, yeah. e- either way, I do know that we want to end this a little bit earlier because Grant has some uh, business to do this afternoon. So we're going to give him a little bit more time. Shady dealings. So with, with that, Austin, I'm going to throw you uh, any shout outs you have other than Jerome Powell, your your boy. Yeah, <laughs> my my boy Jay Powell and and my for buddy gary um i want to shout out allison for coming and joining yeah. us last week yeah and then i want to kind of give a shout out to nick um so nick stobe he's awesome uh really good really smart guy he tunes into all of our episodes and so i want to give mm-hmm. him a big shout out great uh, shout out real quick to j three through three we didn't get to your comment we do agree i do agree with this personally that uh, people, all, the banks are only as strong as people uh, that have faith in them. But thank you for your comment. Sorry we didn't get to it sooner. Um, and shout out to the people who are educating themselves. I, I think, you know, Jared, you just made this point. The people don't know. And I, I, am, I am what I would probably call an OG constitutionalist, a strict constitutionalist. I do believe the Constitution should change. I do believe it should evolve. I do believe we can get rid of some old amendments. Um, and stuff like that. But I, I am a firm believer in the spirit of it. And the spirit of it was that we had an intelligent constituency. And too many of these systems are set up all oh, paternalistically. And so I, I, I have a shout out for anyone who's got the chutzpah to maybe get into crypto because of many reasons. But what you're really doing is becoming um, a sovereign citizen on your finances because you have to learn about the responsibility of self-custody. So um, not just about crypto, but about financial freedom in general. So my shout out is for those who are going out of their way to to have a greater understanding of uh, financial uh, uh, stewardship, aka financial freedom. Jared. Yeah, shout out to uh, to Justin Allison and J three three three. I I agree with your last comment here. The Fed knows the banks are not managing the risk properly uh, or appropriately. They knew that the rate rate hikes would drive their bonds underwater. They did. They drove the rate hikes because they had to. Right. Once again, it was either inflation or it was recession. So they went for the recession. They started to get a taste of that. And then they went back towards inflation, I think. So either way, shout out to everyone in the comments. Um, yeah, we're thank here you every guys. Tuesday at 3.30 Eastern. Yeah. Um, and you can find us on YouTube at Not Crypto Bros on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Reach out if you yeah. would like to guest or I don't know. Just Yeah. Or just if you know someone up. sharp, we got to talk to a super sharp person, Allison, last week. We're going to bring Bar- Brian Naughton in as soon as he's available. Um, but if you know of someone super smart that can school us in the wise ways of being badassery in crypto, let us know. And thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Peace.